Season's greetings, hello and welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer and as ever I am your host. Now usually on this podcast we take you through uh, the evolution and the history of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. However, this week we're taking a little break for some spooky festive treats. Uh, This week we're going to be talking Christmas ghost stories in celebration of a brand new ghost story airing on BBC Two at 10.30pm here in the UK on Christmas Eve. That's an adaptation of M.R. James's The Mezzo Tint directed by Mark Gatiss. Now later on in this episode I'm going to be joined by friend of the pod Adam Robinson and we're going to be talking about some of our favourite ghost stories and discussing the mezzo tint in spoilerific detail. But first of all, as an extra special Christmas gift for you all, I was lucky enough to sit down and chat to one of my absolute heroes, the director of the mezzo tint, Mark Gatiss. Now I'm sure most of you listening know who Mark Gatiss is. Uh, He has been responsible for some of the best television over the last 20 or 30 years. He of course became famous through the League of Gentlemen but since then he's also been partly responsible for uh, the brilliant Sherlock television show starring Benedict Cumberbatch. He was also co-creator of the Dracula adaptation last year but perhaps more importantly he's a huge horror fan and has brought us some incredible horror documentaries over the last decade. Uh, Back in 2010, he created and hosted The History of Horror for the BBC, which for me was an incredibly inspirational, formative documentary, something that really uh, partly inspired this podcast, The Evolution of Horror. He followed that up a couple of years later with Horror Europa as well, another equally brilliant uh, documentary all about European horror over the last hundred years. So he's a horror historian, he's a horror fanatic, and of course he's a huge fan of the classic Christmas ghost story and M.R. James. And over the last few years, he's also been responsible for bringing back the Christmas ghost story to television. In 2013, he directed an adaptation of M.R. James's The Tractate Middeth for the BBC. A few years later, he followed that up with Martin's Close. And this year, the mezzo tint will be his third M.R. James adaptation. So I sat down and chatted to Mark Gatiss, completely spoiler free, about making the mezzo tint. We chatted about M.R. James, about the tradition of ghost stories, and of course we talked about horror cinema, modern horror, folk horror, and a whole bunch of other horror-related topics. So please enjoy my discussion with Mark Gatiss. Okay, I am very honoured and very excited to welcome to the podcast for the very first time, Mark Gatiss. Hello, Mark. Hello, how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm in very sinister shadow here. It's quite appropriate, I feel like. <laughs> it's perfect, isn't it? Yeah, I can only see a kind of Mark Gatiss-shaped silhouette right now because you're sat in front of a window. Uh, it's ideal, actually, because, you know, we're here to talk all things spooky. And, oh my God, Mark, you've got so much stuff going on right now for the spooky festivities, right? You're playing Jacob Marley in A Christmas Carol on stage right now. You've also directed an M.R. James adaptation of The Mezzo Tint and you've directed a brand new adaptation of The Amazing Mr. Blunden as well, another classic Christmas ghost story. So you are single-handedly bringing the spookiness back to Christmas. Yes, I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's accidental. It wasn't meant to be like three buses at once, but it has come that way. Um, it's happened a couple of times before this, but this is my ghostliest and Christmassiest year ever. It's been Christmas for me all year. (laughs) So now it's finally here. I can't quite believe it. Um, Yeah, so Christmas Carol was meant to be on stage last year, obviously was postponed. Um, My original ghost story for Christmas, which was going to be an original, was uh, couldn't happen because of COVID. And so I opted to do an MR James instead when we could finally do one because it was more COVID friendly and also kind of more um, traditional, to be honest. (laughs) I thought that's what people Mm. needed because my my original story was set in a hospital and largely composed of dying old people. And I thought, I'm going to read the room on this one. (laughs) Um, and then uh, Mr. Blunden in the middle of the year. So it's worked out extraordinarily, really. Yeah. Fantastic. What is it about Christmas that w- is so perfect for a spooky ghost story, do you think? What is it particularly about this time of year that works so well for it? I don't know. It's an old tradition, isn't it? It goes way back to fireside storytelling. The fact that it's a 
a pagan festival that Christianity was overlaid on means it's got very deep roots for us in kind of folk horror. <laughs> it always mm -hmm. feels like there's something lurking there. It feels like a sort of liminal time when, when the old year is dying, the new one is coming, and therefore the possibility of something coming emerging from the shadows feels quite strong. Also, for me, it's very it's a very melancholy time for a lot of people, um, which I which I've always liked. I, it's 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 deep in it. I think is the sort of sense of jollity and sadness and people we've lost and looking ahead, but also looking back to all those Christmases of childhood and stuff like that. So it's inevitable more than, I mean, you, you don't get those sort of things at Easter or summertime. It's, it's so etched. It's so etched in our consciousness as we can't help, but remember Christmas past, you know? Um, and I've always liked the idea that as it were, that the, the fairy lights also cast a long shadow. <laughs> oh, yeah absolutely there's something about that aesthetic isn't there as well i think that's so perfect and and it feels more british in a way doesn't it than for example um, it, it doesn't seem as much of a tradition in america for example as it does no no well. i mean they have a kind of you know uh i watched what was that i watched that one with tony collette last year with about the bad oh krampus was yeah krampus? Krampus, which I rather yeah. but you know they're, they're they're that's a scandinavian tradition isn't it and we, it's for some reason englishness and ghosts have always gone together and christmas feels like the perfect time you know i mean mm -hmm. i my last two we had to shoot literally in the hottest days of the year and <laughs> and it does give it a different flavor but we managed to do the mezzo tint in february of this year and it was freezing and it you know it's properly bleak the the the, the opening shot on the golf course is like stark and of course i made sure i put my favorite things which is which is uh crows going <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Which tells you everything you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about, I mean, this is the third M.R. James adaptation you've directed, right, for TV. Um, when did you first sort of discover and fall in love with M.R. James? I think, well, I, I have very strong memories of watching the original Lawrence Gordon Clark films in the 70s, particularly mm. uh, Lost Hearts, uh, The Treasure of Abbott Thomas, and then The Signalman, which of course is Dickens, but that's, those are the ones that have really stuck with me. And then I caught up with the earlier ones mm -hmm. uh, later on. I mean, maybe I did watch them. It's, felt, it's, it's so hard to remember. I mean, I watched everything when I was a kid, everything, yeah. anything vaguely supernatural. But there is a possibility that I wasn't allowed to stay up late to watch A War Into the Curious because I was, I was only six. But <laughs> I'm, I, don't, I still don't know because my dad used to let me watch anything. So... It's possible, but those are the ones I remember the best. And then I had a, I got a book from the library, which weirdly was not M. R. James' stories. It was a, a kind of coffee table book of covers of like ghost stories of an antiquary, and um, it was sort of about M. R. James. And then I read the stories because I devoured ghost stories, and uh, so th that was my way in. I, but I would say definitely through through the TV, uh, ironically, which is rather nice. <laughs> yeah, I had, I had the same experience, actually. I kind of discovered M.R. James relatively recently, and it was through the TV adaptations. I, I got the BBC Ghost Stories for Christmas box set, and they just blew me away, those adaptations. And, you know, what I found really interesting about those adaptations, you know, Whistle and I'll Come to You by Jonathan Miller from 1968, and then all of the Lawrence Gordon Clark ones from the 70s, is that they have this kind of sparse strange queasy surreal almost art house vibe there's something very cinematic about them they don't feel like television plays and to me they certainly don't feel like adaptations of prose of the written word because there's something so atmospheric in a kind of cinematic way about them um and it's just really interesting isn't it that mr james why do you think mr james particularly lends itself to that do you think you know uh, stories that are so descriptive in some ways uh, in the way they're written you know, translating to that kind of an adaptation on screen. It's a very interesting story, really, because the, um, I mean, it, the, the first one, Whistle, is 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 an arts film. It's an omnibus. Mm. So, um, so that's very much in that sort of late sixties aesthetic, and, and therefore, you know, Jonathan Miller always maintained he had no particular feel for the genre. He just wanted to sort of explore it. He, it's his voiceover at the beginning, which says James is a sort of cranky scholarship, isn't it? That's, yeah. And um, but it's so utterly beautiful. And then obviously 
was a huge influence. I think really is the reason they they carried on a couple of years later with Stores of Barchester and in the same sort of mode. But what Lawrence picked up on and 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 ran with is 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 that sort of sense of making little films, I guess. And obviously mm. they're on 16 mil and it's just a totally different world. This is the thing I've I've had to battle with, to be honest, to try and keep them going, is that the the slot basically simply doesn't exist anymore. It's a half hour play or a 35 minute play. And there aren't any plays on the telly, uh, except inside number nine. And uh, so it's a very hard thing, it's a hard sell, because even though everyone loves them, to actually get the money together and the wherewithal, because that that thing has sort of gone. Ironically, my very first one with the Tractate Middleth came out of arts because what I was asked to do was do a documentary about James. And uh, I said no twice because I was very, very busy. It was incredibly busy year. That's insanely busy year. But eventually I gave in. I said, I'll do it on one condition, which is that I can do one of the stories because there's no point in doing the documentary. So weirdly, it, it was done in the sort of 70s way that was. We actually... We actually ended up siphoning as much money as possible from the documentary into the oh, into the drama. <laughs> perfect, yeah. Um, but that is a very hard model to continue, you know. So, but back to your point about a certain style. I think, I mean, the stories are written to be read. Uh, they are full of funny voices, which James obviously liked doing, particularly sort of Cockney manservants and things like that. <laughs> There's always a strong element of humour, which I think you ignore at your peril. And and this, I mean, some of my favourite stuff. I one of I love the the montage in um, Stores of Barchester, which is one of my favourites, about Canon Pulteney's birthday celebrations and just the cleverness that there's fewer and fewer people. Eventually, just Robert Hardy. <laughs> it's yes. sort of less. It's so it's so sparse, as you say. It's sparse and clean and clever. And 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 some of those images are absolutely unforgettable. You know, they really are. Yeah, you 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 mentioned things like Inside Number Nine, and there's that sort of there's that brilliant Inside Number Nine where they sort of they they sort of um, pay homage to those kind of Christmas plays, right? The Devil of Christmas, which very yes. much feels like a television play. Oh, but it's studio. an ATV. It's it's. I mean, they even got um, they even got um the great um, uh, Graham. Oh God, come on, Graham Harper. Uh, who, who was really one of the last directors working who did studio drama in the seventies uh, like that? And it's it's so it's so perfect. I mean, it's just it's always it is it's just amazing that one. But but there is that feeling, right? That it's a studio, that it's very much a play, a kind of multi-camera play. Whereas again, like you said, the the the, the BBC Christmas ghost stories have a different kind of vibe. And again, how important was that to you that? you know, with things like the mezzo tint, that you were on a location, you weren't in a set, for example, um, yeah. because that feels like it's very important to MR James as well. Oh, yes, I think it is. The location filming, I mean, you know, we were very lucky this year to get Harrow School, which is like having, actually like having our own studio because everything was so handy. But mm. the golf, you know, the, the frozen golf course exterior and uh, that's why ideally, you know, it would be nice to go to Suffolk and, 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 and get you, those those um, landscapes just a, a huge part of it if you're able to you know, but it's 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 always about money sadly and um, trying to trying to do it within those limits. I mean, ironically, um, the dead room uh, the dead room happened because I, I I literally petitioned every year following the track tape minutes to try and do another one. Eventually, Cassie and Harrison at BBC Four sort of caved in and he said, "Can you do it for?" I won't say how much because it wasn't a lot of money. <laughs> and I said, yes, I can. <laughs> but I wrote it to suit. Uh, and I thought, I can do, we can do this. It's a three day shoot in a radio studio, cast of sort of three, really. It, it's a very bespoke piece. And what I decided to do with that one was sort of what I dramatized was, was MR James's rules. Mm -hmm. So it is, a, it's, it is a James story in the sense of it's all about what he says you have to do. That you you know the, the ghost should should be from about thirty or forty years ago. It should um, you must hold back. You must not see the ghost too much. And if you watch it, it actually follows the rules quite closely. There's a there's a bit which no one has ever picked up on, which I really love. I think when Simon Callow is saying "hold back, hold back" until the last minute, that you can just see the ghost behind him, right, really deep oh. in the shadows. It's like the first time it appears is when he's saying 
hold back into the last possible moment. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Why is it such a battle mark to get these made? Like, you know, because clearly there is an audience for them, right? I don't know. It's it's a sort of, it's weird. I know. I wish it weren't because what would be lovely is is just a sort of, um, just a, a commitment to do it and not to sort of feel like you're starting from scratch every time. It's a sort of amnesia. I think when it gets to Christmas, <laughs> when it gets to Christmas, everyone goes, oh, I'm oh great. There's a new one. But in the interim, when you actually have to get it commissioned and made, people seem to forget that. But I mean, they've been repeating the originals since Halloween. Yes, an extraordinary commitment to to uh, to to the to the genre, really, and and to keeping it going. But I don't know. I, I, it would be lovely to just go. I tell you what, I really like. I, I have tried this as well. I tried to persuade them to let me sort of shoot three at once. Yes. So they, if you bank go, like, a few, yeah. Then you go, you bank a few, but it, you know, but it's all to do with, um, it's all to do with financial year, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know. So yes, that. of course. It was a point actually when we were doing Martin's Close, and the last thing we shot was, um, was Simon Williams's bits, the linking bits, and he, Simon was just sat in front of a fire, and. You know, it was it was really straightforward. It was such a lovely morning. It only took the morning. And I remember thinking then, oh, I, I wish I'd, if I, if I just had a little Jack and Dory like story now, we could just do another one. <laughs> and then yes. weirdly, weirdly, if we had, it would have been in the bank to be on last Christmas when COVID hit. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know that would have been perfect. Um, so tell me a little bit about the mezzo tint and kind of what was it that made you pick this particular story? Tell me a bit about your sort of relationship and history with this particular story and why you chose it. Oh, well, it's one of my favourites. I think it's a very clever story. Mm. And it's sort of, it's a really good original idea, which Goss has been actually ripped off a lot elsewhere. But the idea of something changing when you're not looking at it and... Yes. Uh, and it's such a creepy idea, but it, to be honest, it was very much because it was a chamber piece. I thought this is a, this will be a small cast. It's about a picture, so you're not talking about really very elaborate ghostly effects until until it appears, if it appears. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it felt very doable, and, and I mean that's an interesting thing, you know, retrospectively, you often wonder around the circumstances in which things are made and. Martin's Close, which we did in 2019, wouldn't be feasible this time because it was a, is a had a had 35 extras as the jury and things like that, and so um, it was genuinely. I thought I look I, I looked through a lot of them, I, having decided it would be good to do it an MR James again for kind of comfort, <laughs> um, yeah. and it felt the most doable really, and also it's a famous story which I don't think has been done. I mean, I know it's been read. Uh, I don't think there are any dramatizations. Um, so tell me, what did you? Again, we don't have to spoil too much here, but you know there are some there are some differences, right, in your version to uh, to the original story as well. Tell me a little bit about that process and kind of updating it, I suppose, and changing it slightly. Well, I think you've always got to regard it as a slightly different beast. Jonathan Miller famously said, actually, about his Alice in Wonderland, if you're just going to do the book, then just read the book. But I, I think it, without sort of chucking the baby out with the bathwater, you have to look at it as a dramatization. It doesn't really have an ending. It sort of mm. it sort of fizzles out. So I thought it would be nice to give it a bit more of a rigorous ending. And actually, I think you need to see a little more than the picture change. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. But also, I'm a big fan of EC Comics and their kind of totally unjustified cruelty towards people. So. <laughs> <laughs> Rory, maybe that Rory pays a heavy price for not really doing anything wrong, as, as people often do. Yeah. But that's right. That's a really interesting thing as well, isn't it? I think people might think of M.R. James as quite stuffy or low key, but these these stories are violent. They're quite cruel a lot of the oh, time, I mean, aren't they? Well, you know, I mean, you get it. it for instance, in uh, in uh, War into the Curious, you 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 really get the violence uh, of what happens to Peter Vaughan at the end. But in the story. When when they find the body, it says his whole his jaw was smashed to bits. It's mm. really horrible. I and mean, I think that's what I've always loved about James. He doesn't pussyfoot around it. it. It's they're very charming stories. They're very funny. They've got a sly kind of humor to them. But the ghosts are really nasty, and he knows what he's doing. You know, I mean, there's what can com- possibly compare to finding under your pillow. A mouth. Oh my God! Yeah, a mouth with hair and teeth, but not, he says, the mouth of a human being. 
Jesus it's Christ. Horrible. <laughs> there's there's something and that's it, there's something so sort of tactile, isn't there, in, in in his descriptions, and not just of the kind of the monsters and the ghosts, but also of the surroundings, right? The architecture, the artifacts, that kind of thing. Um that must be quite a lot of, I mean, I suppose that must be important as a director, right? When you're kind of realizing these things, whether it's the production design, the props, the costumes, whatever, kind of bringing yes. those descriptions I mean, to life. There's a, you know, you get a, you get an instant thrill from period costumes. And and, and uh, again, I did something on this one with, um, uh, we had basically, we, we could do, because of COVID, we could do like one exterior, one big exterior with some people with some mm. extras and but it was harry so it looks like a college and all the college architecture is very helpful um and uh i remember on tractate uh there were some there were some bosses in the on the roof on the ceiling of um cheatham's library where we shot it in manchester and you know that that's pure lawrence golden clark to me a, a, a gargoyle or a boss and and actually we just we just shifted the light so that the sort the shadow just sort of made it almost look like it was it, the eyes were moving you know it, oh, it, it is because it's so collegey um if you find if you can find the right location and you can sort of, you can shoot almost anywhere and it has a sort of jamesian flavor to it doesn't it do you think there's anything about mr james stories that now feel dated where you feel as a director as a responsibility to update anything for 2021 audiences i did a few i mean for instance uh, i set uh, tractate in the 50s because i thought it would be interesting given that a lot of the lawrence golden clarks well they, they, they feel like a lot of them feel like they're in the 20s and 30s i thought it might be quite nice to bring it on a bit and i deliberately i was i was Dead Room was an experiment in in literally testing the rule. It's like, well, if the if the ghost should be from thirty or forty years ago, it should be from the seventies. And literally, one of the characters said, "Would a ghost from the seventies work?" You're actually postulating the thing, and I, I think it does because it's weird. It just brings a different sensibility. I mean, I'm I, I'm very interested in modern ghost stories. The the one I wrote, which we didn't do, is present day, and mm. I find it just as fascinating. I think it's just, and I and I, I would, you know, as long as I, I'm able to carry on doing these, I want to keep pushing it forward. I don't think it should be an exercise in pure nostalgia. Mm-hmm. We want to try and do different stuff. I was watching Stigma the other day, you know, which was the last of Oh, the, yeah. Obviously, the Ice House is the last one. But, you know, it's a fascinating thing. And again, you can't quite believe it was ever made. <laughs> it's so horrible. Oh, my God. It gets so nasty. It's so the- <laughs> nasty. Nasty, really. But, but, um, but you know, the, Lawrence and, and Rosemary Hill, they, they were trying to keep it, pushing it forward. And I think that's very admirable. I guess you just have to think in the end that the ones that people remember and the ones that people want uh, have a certain flavour to them. And there's also nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's what Christmas is also about. You know, I'd love to do some other writers. I'd love to do EF EF Benson. I've got a couple of cherished ones, which I'd love to do, like um, The Upper Birth. Uh, and uh, the room in the tower, and mm-hmm. hor- and green tea. I've always well, that's very difficult to do, but but um, but you know, James has a has a a, a USP, <laughs> and as soon as you see the name, you go, oh okay, I know where I am. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for that as well. So. There's there's this kind of interesting device, something I found really interesting visually when watching the mezzo tint is that obviously it's about this painting and there's characters kind of taking photos of the painting and we're sort of watching a TV show of somebody taking photos of looking at and, and, and there is and it kind of reminded me of there's this interesting kind of framing device in a lot of MR James stories like that too, right? That is it important to sort of have that sort of distance with stories like MR James ones where you've kind of got a story told by a yes. story told by a storyteller, you know, that Again, that, that's one of his rules. I mean, I didn't do it this time, but I, I uh, in Martin's Close, there is a, you know, there's a narrator who is, mm. tells you the context that again, that was a lot of that was budgetary, budgetary because Simon could explain a lot of things that we couldn't couldn't, couldn't shoot, you know. But yes. I, I do I like that, and 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 his stories are off. They, they you know they tend to be. Uh, this happened to a friend of mine's friend, 
or there is a story told somewhere. And, and there's something very lovely about that because it gives what he calls the haze of distance, doesn't it? And and it's mm. just just feels plausible then. Um, I like, I've always, and it also, you know, it just, as soon as you put someone in a leather armchair, you go, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I feel very happy now. And I, I shall just, I mean, you probably, I don't know if you, you know, you, I'm sure you do, the the, the grown-up Jack and Ori series, Spine Chillers, Yes, um, yes, they're really great, and I remember. I wish they'd done more of those. I remember some of those so well. The John mm-hmm. Woodvine one, um, which is a man about, about a runner, isn't it? But and he's being chased by an unseen presence. I remember being genuinely frightened of that, and I was about twelve or thirteen. It was really scary, and it just shows you there's an amazing power in those. There really is, um, and I, you know, I, I think you could, you can, you could sit someone in a chair and read the story or do a monologue, or you can do a very lavish one with as many period extras and costumes as you can. But the, mm-hmm. the good thing is the form is so powerful and so popular and so right. You know, it, it's just a, it's a lovely thing to, to do. I mean, I, I, as you say, I just, I wish it wasn't always a battle. No, that's it. As a director, how do you pull off achieving those scares you know the famously you know so many mr james stories end in that big scare are you ever tempted to want to put in a couple of smaller scares along the way you know tell me a bit about how you sort of control that pacing and mood i suppose i think i did in, in track tape first one i think we see i think maybe we see the ghost a little too much but i couldn't resist it <laughs> oh it's great well there's a really creepy moment sort of halfway in right in the library where we see it earlier. yeah yeah also it's a day it's in the daytime which i love i love daytime ghosts it's really yeah. creepy that and actually that he walks past it, it's not there. And then it, it turns around and it is there. And it's yeah. it's got its back to him, which is always horrible. And <laughs> just as it, and it took, what he sees literally makes him like go crazy. Um, but it's, it's sometimes hard to resist, but it's about the restraint and building the sense of dread. And what I'm really pleased with, with, with Metzotint is, uh, we sort of, uh, Kieran uh, McGuigan, the DOP and I, we, we talked a lot about the lenses that would sort of start to get into Rory's head. So it kind of gets closer and closer. And he's also actually pushed further and further to the edge of the frame, like he's isolated. And you start, you think, is he going mad? Am I going mad? Is he going mad? You know, um, but I, I, in the end, you know, when you've got it, when you've managed to shoot shoot the material, uh, an awful lot is constructed in the edits, of course, in terms of pacing, but also just the just the way that uh, you do the scares and you do the um, you know you do the 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 temporary scares, as it were, like like the piano lid falling. That's just yes. a jump, that's a, just a jump scare to remind you that it's a ghost story <laughs> and to stay okay. tuned. But it's a it's a challenge because you also want to try different stuff and you don't want them all to feel like they, they have the same pattern but obviously there is a pattern because that's that's James's style you know but um, I always love doing and I love the, the the sort of trying to make the ghost different each time and how that would how would that would work you know there are breath and breathtaking things to me like um, the last shot of Abbott Thomas when Michael Bryant thinks the doctor is coming towards him and then it just goes to that high shot and you just it's just brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, it's brilliant. yeah. The, and uh, you know, Abbott Thomas is a great example of that. The, the big scare is almost like a jump scare, isn't it? That moment when he sort of he discovers that sort of screaming face. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Ah! But, but, yeah perfect. But then there are these other ones again going back to something like whistle where it's sort of not really a jump scare it's something weirder and more dreamlike and nightmarish and again there are those different and i think i've seen that in ones you've directed too there are those different types of scares i suppose oh, yeah again, it's very just important traditional wallop type, type of scare no, because yeah. you, you get bored of those but also you you it's about unease so you know yeah. my absolute favorite thing is is i mean the cl- there's great the great cleverness of in abbott thomas of again, as a free adaptation, is establishing this entire made-up plot line about him exposing the fake mediums because it means he's a rational man and then he then his, his world falls apart. So you, and when you end with him going, it is a thing of slime, I think, and <laughs> yes. darkness. It's just because he's actually trying to work out what it is, like a scientist would with a new life form, you know. It's so horrible. <laughs> yeah, so cold, isn't it? I love it. Um, tell me, I'd love to ask you a little bit about, you mentioned you made a, an M.R. James documentary. Um, I absolutely loved, uh, part of the 
reason that I made my own podcast, The Evolution of Horror, is thanks to your fantastic documentaries like The History of Horror and Horror Europa. I just wondered, you know, tell me a little bit about that. And and are you ever tempted to go back and make another horror documentary? And if so, what would you cover next? It's the same old problem. <laughs> yes, the battle. Uh, we, we wanted to, we did want to do a third one, which was basically, well, it's probably... I guess horror Asia or so, or the sort of rest oh, wow. of the world, but it's just too ex- it was too expensive. I mean, it was all about Japan and and Korea, and it just it was just wasn't possible. So mm-hmm. horror Europa almost broke us because we had to do. I think we went to seven countries in ten days, just oh, literally. Wow. I mean, it's thrilling now. I wish I could do it now because it was like the old days when you could go anywhere. But we were we went kind of. Snowblind. I remember getting into Madrid to interview Jorge Grau about living down at the Manchester morgue. Yeah, and we were so, we didn't we genuinely we we sat in a cafe and tried to order breakfast, and no one could remember what language we were supposed to be <laughs> ma- mauling. <laughs> it was just mad. <laughs> I, I love that moment when you. I think it's I think it's in Europa when you're interviewing Dario Argento, right? And he suddenly switches from Italian to English, and he goes, "Oh, I'm speaking English now." And you go, "You can speak English all the time." He just starts talking about <laughs> bubbles, and he bubbles, bubbles. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was so. There was such a. It was a thrill to do them, and actually, I was very, very grateful to them because they, they, that approach came out of the blue. And to be honest, I'd, I'd, my my, my interest in horror films had sort of waned. Uh, I, I just, I guess, I was just a bit out of the loop, and it all came flooding back interviewing all those wonderful people, but also discovering an awful lot of films that I'd only ever really known as black and white stills in, in the glossy books I had as a kid. And, mm. you know, I mean, we just didn't see Mario Barba films. We knew about, I remember thinking, who is Barbara Steele? Why is everyone bagging up about her? <laughs> but yeah. I, you couldn't see the films. And then to discover that they were, I think, you know, really infinitely more interesting than the Hammer ones that they were sort of inspired by. They're so weird and transgressive and naughty. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I love it was a lovely experience. So it would be it would be great to do. And also, I, but I'm also very intrigued by the fact that um, some countries just don't really have the same tradition. They have f- folk tales and 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 things like that. But horror as a genre hasn't caught on. It's really interesting, and it sort mm. of travels the world. It blossoms somewhere and then withers, and then it appears somewhere else. And you suddenly suddenly it's like oh yeah all the interesting ones are coming out of Japan now or something like that. And uh, I find that really fascinating as to why that is. And also why, you know, why, why isn't there a great horror tradition in Norway or um, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I first sort of discovered uh, sort of, I suppose, international horror around the turn of the millennium. And I think that was partly because I was just coming to that age where I was growing, growing interested in, in international cinema, but also a lot of American horror, I found there was a bit of a dip in in the good stuff there, whereas actually, again, going back to things like J-horror, Asian horror, even French horror during the 2000s was quite astounding, I think. Um, And there's something you mentioned at the end of your History of Horror documentary where you kind of, you know, you go up to sort of the late 70s and then you sort of, you sort of, you say you, you, you have you have less interest in some of the stuff that comes afterwards, right? And I just wanted to ask you a bit about that. You know, what are your thoughts now on modern horror, on, on horror cinema of the last decade or so? Is there anything that, you, that has kind of really struck you or that you love? The big thing about that was, and, and the reason it was called A History of Horror, is that it has, I mean, I left out some of my absolute favourite films. But, mm. you know, I remember, because it, it was this is 10 or 11 years ago, early days of Twitter, literally a- Every time, every episode that went out, someone would say, "What about? What about? What about? What oh, about?" I know. You and eventually, I said, "This, yeah." <laughs> you, I, what What you want me to do is sit in a chair and read out a list of films. What What else can I possibly do? So I've left out. There's no Theatre of Blood. Incredibly, one of my absolute favourite movies is not in there because you know we had to, we, we had to specify things and we we decided like for instance we decided to do a little bit on the exorcist exorcist because it's been so well covered but do a big number on the omen because it hasn't etc you yeah. know you understand and also the reason we stopped at halloween is it was a real game changer and everything that comes after it is then a, a, a sort of separate documentary you know um so I, I'm, I'm generally not fond of 80s films. I know that's a very sweeping statement, especially as I was brought up in the 70s and 80s. But I find a lot of the big movies of the 80s terribly disappointing. Really, really 
clunky and 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 rather ugly looking in a way that seventies just aren't. Um, and a lot of that, and the, the, a lot of the slasher movies, I find like that. I just find them, I guess, just a bit dull, and repetitive, you know. So, but to go back to your point, I mean, I think we're in a great place these days because there's so much fabulous stuff and and really unexpected stuff. I was watching, what did I watch recently? Uh, His house is it? I yes, that's fantastic. Really, I mean, it's 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 it makes a very interesting point, but it's a modern ghost. It's a modern haunted house story. It's really alarming at times. Um, my absolute favorite of the last few years is Under the Shadow, which I think is a, mm. is a brilliant film, and all the better for being. I, I was saying this to someone yesterday. Um, I was actually on a BAFTA panel for best newcomer, judging best newcomer, and it was on a link, and I knew nothing about it at all. And I watched the first 15 minutes quite gripped by this sort of domestic drama set in Tehran in 1980. And then went, Jesus, it's a, it's a ghost story. I was so <laughs> thrilled. But I mean, I, th- I learned an awful lot from that film um, about you can take all the very familiar parts of a haunted house story or, or any kind of horror story and you can make them live again by, by changing the geography. I mean, I've never seen any horror film set in Iran uh, or like the girl who walks home at, at night and, and stuff like that. You know, there it's you go. This is a different world, and everything changes. The cultural influences are totally different. The vampire law, the what it's, it's different, and and I find that really exciting as to, as a sign of where we're going. You know, um, do, do you think that horror? You know, people have written a lot in the last few years about horror having a bit of a resurgence having a bit of a golden age of course a lot of people argue of course that's not the case horror's always been here it's always been popular but there is some sort of kind of wave at the moment where it's you know horror movies are getting oscar nominations for example or they're, they're making more best of the year list movies like uh movies like his house or get out or whatever else you know ari Aster films like hereditary do you think that's the case are are horror movies better than they have been in the last say 20 to 30 years or is it that audiences tastes are changing we're embracing horror more there's always a golden age. There's never a golden age. Yeah, yeah. That's the truth. There are good. There's good stuff and there's utter shit. There always has been. Uh, I think. I think we're in a good place. But the one thing I don't want horror to become is respectable, because that's deadly. And mm. it should always, the, to me, always the ones that remain very interesting are the transgressive ones where you think you think you know where you are, and there's something about that kind of. To me, it's a bit like Ryan Murphy. Uh, making so many programs, which high-end, glossy programs, but they all feel the same. Yes. And I think we've got to be careful that we don't get into a sort of slot where you go, oh, yeah, I know what to expect from this. And sometimes it's it's very nice if it, it feels it feels like you're, you're in good hands. You're in, in grown-up hands and they're, they're going to deliver things. But if you think, I actually, this is just like the last one, then you know. Um, I mean, that, to me, it's always about it's always about the elusive grail of the one that really shits you up, <laughs> and and it's really hard to find because you get you get you get inured to it. So I mean, jump shocks always make me jump. I don't. I'm not. I'm not like dead inside. In, term, <laughs> in terms of the the horror films that that will genuinely disturb or, or make you think for weeks or months afterwards. They're very rare. And that it has to be something that kind of, I guess it is something that surprises you, isn't it? That you just think, I never saw that coming. I think that's, and that's very difficult. But, but yeah. every now and then someone achieves something, it comes out of left field, like get out, I think, you know, that, that you... Uh, you kind of go, wow, this is really quite something. It, it's about more than it appears to be. It's not just a drive-in horror movie. Nothing, nothing wrong with those. But, but you're actually creating something about speaking about what horror is. That is really interesting. What scares us now? The ones that I can't. There are some I can't watch some to this day. I have no interest whatsoever in house invasion films. I can't oh, yeah. watch them because I like supernatural horror. House invasion films feel possible and therefore they scare me to death, but in the in, in the wrong way. I don't want to right. think about that. But, you know, something like um uh something like the Babadook, um, I thought 
to me that the most interesting stuff in it was was where she was going mad trying to control this feral child when it became like poltergeist with papa lazaru in it i i just thought i don't i just <laughs> don't know what this is um but i think that that's that's something to hang on to hereditary the same um it got very daft i thought but there are certain parts of it, especially that bit when Tony Collette sees her mother's ghost in the corner, which oh, yeah. made my hair stand on it properly. And you go, that's a wonderful moment. That is something that, how have they done that? It's sort of just the way you imagine you'd see a ghost if you saw a ghost. It's sort of made of particles of dust. And it was horrible, really yeah. horrible slowly sort of coming into focus yeah. yeah it's wonderful isn't it yeah i totally know what you mean and actually in some ways i was sort of I, I, there are a lot of criticisms leveled at the hereditary for how silly it gets in that last 20 minutes or so in some ways i was almost grateful for that catharsis because it was so oppressive you know like the the, the kind of grief and misery of the bulk yeah. of that film as well was like like you said there's there it does have one films. of my absolute favorite things which is elderly naked satanists <laughs> which i which i still find perhaps more frightening than anything else <laughs> that's it and actually i've got to ask you briefly about you know one of the other i think massive things about your original history of horror documentary was folk horror right it really feels like and i i know i'm sure you don't want to sort of toot your own horn here but i feel like folk horror has become a thing and has become a a subgenre in this last decade probably very largely thanks to your documentary and your mention of folk horror um, well, very- which is has become like one of the most i think one of the most popular sort of subgenres of horror right oh my god yeah it really has. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I remember, you know, it's so weird. I can't quite remember the circumstances in which that was said, but it's it's become one of those things where it's like it was coined that I'm sure it wasn't. But anyway, it definitely caught on. And now something which didn't feel like it was much talked about has become a, not just a staple, but almost the bedrock of it. Because <laughs> maybe, maybe because they're very cheap to do. You go out to the countryside with a steady cab. And it's you can do that. <laughs> a folk horror now. But um, I, I mean, they're still my favourites. I, I mean, w- the only danger, like with all these things, is they become slightly, they lose something from the repetition of it. Whereas uh, yeah. perhaps the original, the scarcity of something like that made it feel very particular. I remember, you know, in all my Friday night horror watching as a kid, the re- one of the reasons that Blood on Satan's Claw always, I loved it, was because it was so unusual. And, mm-hmm. you know, you know that it started life as a Victorian portmanteau and mm-hmm. Piers Haggard said, no, let's do something different. And you, it, it's, it's a bit like what I was saying about Under the Shadow. It so repays the novelty of it. And then I suppose inevitably, if you get a lot of things set around sort of 17th century squires and witches and things, it start, it becomes too familiar. But it's a lovely thing. And it, it, it go back to James, it, it sort of taps into a deep reservoir of, unease about the countryside and about folk traditions and the, and the, you know, uh, appeasing the crops with blood or, you know, it, it, we, we, we all feel it's true, even if it isn't. <laughs> it's so true. And there's something so, um, there is something sort of vague about that description of folk horror, I think, that people find really interesting. I find really interesting. I think you're right. You know, when it comes to something like slasher movies, there's a very obvious format right whereas when you look at the movies you looked at for folk horror blood on satan's claw wicker man which find a general they're all actually quite different right one of them is yeah, supernatural, natural yeah. the others aren't yeah. you know one of them's about a cult the others are and so like i think it it kind of expands people's imaginations to be like oh maybe that's folk horror maybe that's folk mm, horror you know it's mm. an interesting thing the, the, the one uh, the recent movie which i absolutely hated was midsummer oh I, really i hated it because i i mean, it's beautifully shot I quite like the bit, the dark bit at the beginning where they, where she mm. poisons her parents because uh, it was, but I just couldn't understand. I said to my friend afterwards, it's like, it was like going to a Kaylee for three fucking hours. Uh, <laughs> but what I don't understand, it was like, it, it's like going, it was like going to the pictures in 1974 to see the Wicker Man. And on the way in, someone says, it's a conspiracy. They burn him at the end. It just, it did exactly what we knew it was going to do. Yes. I don't understand what I don't understand the fuss or also why why you would make a film that had no surprises in it. I mean, even the pube, even down to the pube sandwich, it was all <laughs> it was all telegraphed and actually literally written on pictures. <laughs> That's true. I know what you mean, but also 
there is a feeling of inevitability about folk horror and Midsummer, which I think can make it scarier. That idea that they are headed towards this fate that they can't escape, right? I, I think that with The Wicker Man, most people who probably watch it for the first time now probably know what it's going to happen at the end, right? They've probably been oh, yeah. spoiled. But it doesn't make that film any less powerful yeah. or scary, I don't think. Well, you can keep watching it because even if you know, and I, but I remember the first time, I simply couldn't believe it's such a clever idea and it all falls into place. You suddenly realise that actually if he'd given in to Britt Eklund's temptation, their whole plan would be off. But they yes. have to te- they have to test him. Uh, it's really it's obviously it's just a wonderful thing, and the the whole idea of of um, of that island being like that is it seems entirely plausible still. This mm-hmm. thing you just think this is this is what can happen when things are cut off like that. <laughs> so true. Yeah, his chance and as in modern parlance. Blew it. <laughs> um, amazing. Well, let me finish by asking you, Mark, what's next? And if you get the chance to do another ghost story next year, fingers crossed, any ideas what you might cover next? Will it be an original one? I don't know. Uh, there is a meeting this week, which is not specifically about the ghost stories, but it's about the financing that would affect it. So uh, they, they do very well on iPlayer, and iPlayer actually is a force to be reckoned with and also has money. So it, it'll it'll probably be the same sort of slight patchwork of 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 bits of money from here, there and everywhere to try and work it work. So it depends on how much I can get and when we can do it. Uh, the one I really want to do is Count Magnus because it eluded Lawrence, Scott and Clark and it's also marvellous. And but it's set in Sweden. So mm. I don't think we could do that, but we, might, you know, it might be possible if we can get the money. Otherwise, I, I mean, I have to, I'll have to go by what they want. They, they did want another original, and it's written. Uh, whether people want something set in a hospital at the moment, I still don't know. Uh, equally, as I say, there are lots of other writers. It would be great to do. There's a, there is a story I've always loved since I was a child, and has. It's it's amazing how these things stay with you. Uh, the, the the first few things you ever see on the TV or on the, the cinema or you read, they they just stay. It's a story by E. Nesbitt called Man Size in Marble. Do you know it? I don't know. Um, well, read it. I like, yeah. It's it's a lovely story, and it scared the hell out of me as a child. And I've always thought, well, I wonder if you could do that. It would need a little expanding, but the, the actual idea of it is just gorgeous. Um, that's that's a favourite but yeah, we'll just have to see <laughs> wait and see, fingers crossed well Mark Gatiss, thank you so much for joining me my absolute pleasure A huge thank you to the incredible Mark Gatiss. What an absolute treat. I wish I'd had an extra three hours with him, but alas, that was all the time I had. So it's time to talk about the mezzo tint and some further discussions about Christmas ghost stories. And joining me for the second half of this episode, I've got another absolute ghost story aficionado. Uh, He is a writer and director and performer of ghost stories with his theatre company, The Book of Darkness and Light. He hosts the Ghost Story Book Book club podcast like mark gatis he has also just been touring with a stage adaptation of a christmas carol and of course is a very good friend of mine and longtime friend of this podcast welcome back adam robinson hello hi mike how you doing merry christmas merry christmas how are things adam have you done all of your christmas shopping and wrapping and everything yet i have done no wrapping uh, <laughs> whatsoever but i've done all the shopping i, I sort of did that early because I knew that I was going on tour with A Christmas Carol which we've just finished so I did all of my Christmas shopping like really early but I just now have a study full of stuff (laughs) and my other half can't come in the study anymore because it's all stuff for her so um, yeah that's where I am right now (laughs) Yep, exactly the same as you I am sat here in our study right now with a huge pile of boxes and Rihanna is not allowed in (laughs) Um, yeah so that's good glad to see we're all on the same page Uh, tell Tell us a little bit about A Christmas Carol. That's really exciting. Yeah. How's it all been going? It's Yeah, I mean, it's such a strange time, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I feel like every time I speak to you, Mike, I, I, I sort of say the same thing, really, that it's a strange <laughs> time and, you know, and it, and it really is. But like, we, yeah, we we, um, we planned this tour uh, months ago when we, we sort of thought things were going to be a bit brighter uh, uh, than the previous year. 
in terms of you know where we were with the pandemic um, and then we set off on tour and again when we when we started which was really early in December um, there wasn't a sense of, of, of where we were headed in terms of you know the pandemic no. um, but but in in some ways we've been really lucky because we managed to do all of our shows our last show was on the 19th of December mm-hmm. and actually we saw audiences coming out obviously audiences were masked we were taking uh, all the precautions we possibly could you know testing daily and all that sort of thing to make sure that we were protecting ourselves and protecting the audiences um, all of that aside it's been an amazing tour uh, audiences have been incredible um, A Christmas Carol our version our adaptation I'm so proud of it I think it's such a lovely show um, it's got that ghostliness that I really love um, uh, and um, yeah it's it's you know all things considered it's it's been a really fun and amazing uh, tour to do yeah. fantastic and it really is like it's a perfect time isn't it for uh, a, a ghost story like that and Christmas Carol yeah. Christmas Carol is such a it's something that really draws audiences in doesn't it, it by the time it. it's just like it really endures doesn't it as a story yeah it kind of sells itself to a certain extent which is which is fantastic obviously we have our following as the book of darkness and light and we have mm-hmm. lots of people who come out and see us uh, who've seen our shows over the last sort of five six years but a christmas carol you know you pop that on a poster you pop that on marketing and people will come along just to see it and the thing that i love um from audiences the the, the comment that i love most is people who already adore that story telling us that they've really loved our version that that's you know that's such a huge compliment there's so many versions of that story out there obviously um, I'm not even going to have a conversation with you about this. The best one is the Muppets. That is that is the best. <laughs> of course. It is. Do you ever get people? Do you think disappointed that there weren't yep. like Kermit songs and stuff? Yeah. <laughs> I had someone say to me the other day. Um, uh, she, she was joking, but she said to me, "I." Re- it was the second time she'd seen it. She said, "Yeah, I really like it. Um, could do with a few more felt frogs." Um, so I was like, "Thanks, Ruth." <laughs> but but uh, yeah, um, but it's yeah, it's great. And the other thing is that our our um, shows generally are pretty you know they're ghost stories so they're pretty bleak on the whole mm. we don't have a lot of happy endings so this is really lovely to do at this time of year because it's got a really beautiful hopeful uh, ending spoiler alert for anyone who doesn't know christmas carol um <laughs> uh, but yeah it's 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 a delight to do it and then the first thing i want to do when i get home mike from tour is i want to sit down and chuck a christmas carol on the tv i'm never bored of it mm-hmm. i love it so much um so that's what i'm going to be doing over the next few days sort of going plowing into the george c scott and the alistair sim and the oh, yeah. and the kermit yeah and the kermit absolutely uh so let me ask you speaking of i want to ask you we're going to talk about the mezzo tint in a bit but first of yeah. all let me just ask you a bit about christmas ghost stories in general this is something mm. obviously you're you'll literally make a living out of so i'd love <laughs> to ask you adam like why Christmas? Why is Christmas such a perfect time for ghost stories and these types of tales, do you think? It's really interesting. I mean, it's it's a tradition that nobody quite seems to know exactly why it endures in this way. Mm. Nobody quite seems to know the the origin of why, you know, in the English ghost story is so prolific at Christmas. And in fact, I was speaking to a friend of mine the other day who's um uh, she's Canadian and she works at the University of Leeds and they were putting a little um uh, a little thing in their newsletter about my uh, uh, live stream ghost story that I did last night, and um, she was like, "Is it? Is it really a tradition at Christmas time?" I like, and I said, "Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is." And she she didn't quite believe me that it was. So it's so obviously, I guess, tied to this idea of of you know the English ghost story um, or the British ghost story, and. Um, why? I mean, you know, it, it's dark outside. We, 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 there are more people indoors. We're sort mm. of getting together to tell stories around the fire. Maybe that's part of it. I once had a really profound um, conversation with someone who's who's cutting my hair, and this hairdresser said to me, um, "We were talking about ghost stories at Christmas," and she said, "I think part of it is it, it's about it's not just about who is here at Christmas, but it's about who's not here at Christmas." Mm. I was like, "Wow, that's so profound! I'd never thought of it in those terms." So maybe that's it. It's about you know, it's a time that we usually get together, and and of course, in that sense, we think about absence as well. Yeah, um, you know, there are there there are you know paganistic um, roots uh, as well um, but it, I'm glad that it endures and I think that the ghost stories for Christmas that the BBC did you know from the 60s uh, through the 70s I think that is a huge part of why we still hang on to that tradition you know you've got you've got Dickens around around Christmas time um, and he had a few 
ghost stories, um, not just a Christmas Carol that came out uh, in December um, through the years that he was writing. Mm. But I think that I think that the British, um, sorry, I think that the BBC's uh, ghost story for Christmas is is one of the things that makes us reflect on the idea of the ghost story. I really think it's had a huge impact uh, that that endures even in in uh, twenty twenty two. Know, 2021 right? sorry i'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> no you're so right about that what let me ask you a bit about those ghost stories we talked about these before i'm sure um mm. but when did you first discover them the, the bbc ghost stories for christmas the tv adaptations from the 60s and 70s i think the first time i ever saw any of them was the original a whistle and i'll come to you um uh, jonathan miller's and I, I remember it was on TV one time. I was up, I was at my mum's house, and I can't remember. I guess maybe it was. Oh, I might have even been at university by that point. I can't remember, but it was on, and I just kind of chucked it on upstairs. Nobody was interested in watching it, and I put it on. And my first reaction to that movie was that film was. Um, I'm not sure about this actually. It's not quite what I expected, but I was. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Like it was on my mind, not just after I'd seen it, but for for months and years afterwards. Then I think I watched um, a documentary, uh, um, and I wonder if Mark Gatiss was involved in that, I can't remember, that was about this idea of the tradition of the, of the Christmas ghost story. And I started to see images from things like Lost Hearts and Abbott Thomas and uh, One is the Curious, and I was just like, oh my goodness, they look incredible. And then immediately sought out um, the, the DVDs, the BFI's um, incredible box set, uh, and and have sort of devoured them um since then I, i've watched them over and over and over again um yeah 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 same um i i, th- I only discovered them through making this podcast when i was doing my ghost mm. series and uh bought the box set off the back of so many recommendations and i could yeah. not believe how good they were um and what something i've mentioned to mark gatis about that we talked about is that they do not feel televisual right no, they don't, it no. doesn't apart from the length it doesn't feel like you're watching a television play it feels like you're watching some sort of experimental art film for the most part exactly. or something like that right as well yeah, exactly that they're such unique things aren't they and actually i think that there's a seriousness about them uh there's there's a, there's a real poor facedness to them where where you know we know that uh mr james was was quite you know he's quite a comedian he, he was really funny but there's there's an all there's almost a total absence in those 70s uh, uh, adaptations, I would say, of, yeah. of humour. Or, 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 or it's very sparse if it's there at all. There's a little bit, but they're very um, severe, I think, in, in lots of ways. And that just, to be honest, that adds to the, the terror when you're watching them because you realise that what you're watching is something that is being taken very seriously by the people who've made it, but also by the people who are in it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and I find that very, very, very unsettling. There's a real melancholy um, is. about them that that I think is is extremely powerful. Yeah. What I mean, do you think there's something in particularly like why is it that M R James particularly lends himself so well to these kind of successful, weird experimental adaptations rather than any other sort of ghost story writer? Do you think? I think that he 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 leaves a lot of gaps mm-hmm. in his um, deliberately. He leaves a lot of gaps in his in his writing. The the pictures he paints are clear enough, and they're lingering, and they haunt, and they you know as soon as you read a description by M R James, you are um, well. I I certainly am. I I'm just overcome with a sense of the uncanny, the weird. But if you kind of look carefully. at at what he's writing and his descriptions there are, there are gaps there mm-hmm. and we are invited in fact we necessarily when we're reading them fill in those gaps our imagination rushes in and fills in those gaps so I think it's a, a, a filmmaker's dream it's clear enough that you have you know a, a clear sense of what the story is how it progresses what the narrative is but you have these uh, when when you get to the key moments of climax, the you know they've been described as Jamesian wallops mm-hmm. on uh, in, in other places. When you get those, as a filmmaker, as a creative who's, who's you know putting something together in in a visual medium, you've got free reign to a certain extent, or you've got you know you, you, you can do, you can put your stamp on it, shall we say? Um, mm. So I think I think it's that brilliant balance of there's an economy and the clarity, but also. 
a, a sort of delicious ambiguity, a delicious uh, absence of, of 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 all the details. And that's, I mean, what an invitation for for a director, right? Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and the length of them is interesting too, right? I mean, do you think yeah. it's important that these things be short, that they're not stretched into, for example, feature films? Yeah, there's 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 a bit of a school of thought about how long a ghost story should be. I mean, I like a good short, you know, ten to twenty page ghost story. That's 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 what I, they're my favourite ones. If they're any longer than that, I'm a little bit, <laughs> I'm usually a bit reluctant to to read them. But that might be more to do with how much time I've got to read. I don't know. Um, but um, but I think yeah, a, a, a brief visitation, a sort of gradual. Uh, intensity, gradual growing intensity in terms of our encounters with these uh, the spirits and revenants is really important. I think the longer we spend in the company of the threat, the less impactful it is. Having said that, you look at um, uh, you look at the work of Michelle Paver, who who writes these long form um, ghost stories in her novels, and they follow that Jamesian you know ramping up of terror beautifully are long form and are perfectly effective. So I think mm. I think it's about how effective you can make it. I do think simplicity is important. So I think I think a, a relatively simple story is important. But then also the idea of being a detective to a certain extent I think is really important in a ghost story. Ooh, the yeah. idea of uncovering, the idea of something being revealed as you read is really really important as well. So so it, it you know it feels like it might be a simple formula, but I, I think it's, I think it's kind of not. <laughs> yeah, it's really, yeah, you know, it's so true. I think there's a particular art to it, isn't there? Yeah. Into sculpting, into pacing, and everything, and creating yeah. a little story out of a thirty-minute play Absolutely, or a, or a twenty-page yeah. written story. You know, whatever yeah. it might be. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably no, it's probably you know, no coincidence that the only feature film. Um, that follows a James story very, very closely is uh, Night of the Demon. Mm -hmm. And that is, I would say, James's most intricately plotted story. Right. That and, that and the Tractate mid which is obviously um, a Mark Gatiss adaptation as well from a few years ago. But th if you think about the plot of M.R. James stories, they're... There's lots of detail, mm. but the plot is usually very, very simple. It's an academic who goes somewhere, finds something and then is haunted or an academic who comes into possession of a certain thing and is haunted yeah. and more or less that is generally what happens in almost all mr james ghost stories so true uh, what are some of your favorites from the tv adaptations of the 60s and 70s adam do you have any faves i mean i love a whistle of course i do yeah um, I really love Abbott Thomas, The Treasure of Abbott Thomas. Oh There's my something... God, it's so scary, oh, that one. It's, it's so, so scary. scary. It's yeah. so weird. It's so gross. There's so much sort of strangeness early on when it's the young academic and the older academic kind of trying to figure out the puzzle and it's th there's a weirdness between them two uh, as they interact that the, the you know the sort of chiseling away of the of the window uh, to mm. find the clues. Um, I think that's an I think it's a, a masterpiece. I like the ash tree. Some people don't like the ash tree, but I think it's I, know. I mean it's great. And there's some really strange choices in terms of the way you know the the lord approaches the house in the first few minutes and it's just this shot where he's clearly not on a horse but they but it, they made it seem like he is and the ash quiet. tree is the weirdest and i think so weird. um i think it has the most kind of strange nightmarish feel yes. since since whistle like it's yes. got the most kind of like I don't really understand what's what I'm watching or what I'm yes. looking at, you know, and that one really gets me. Yeah, and they make that choice to, to use the same actor to play both of these lords, right, in different periods of time, and so that's really sort of confusing and and, and strange, and you're not always 100 percent sure where you are, mm -hmm. and so to differ differentiate them, they put reverb on the past, <laughs> and that just makes it so weird. And yeah. then you get the, and then you get that incredible monster thing those little um the little spider things oh my god that are amazing and it's so surprising in 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 um in a film that seems that kind of demonstrates how low budget it is in the making of it you get these really great little creatures the design is amazing yeah i think it's um I think that's one that gets overlooked a bit. Um, Stunning, yeah, I, isn't it? And of course, a warning to the curious, right? As well. Oh, yeah. What a great 
that works so well as like a little television film as well, I think, it does. doesn't it? Because of that kind of violent opening scene followed by then yeah. everything that happens all the way up till the end. It's just Absolutely. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, so before we get into the mezzo tin, let me ask you about uh, um, Mark Gatiss as well. Yeah. And, you know, obviously he's kind of, he's been battling to kind of bring this tradition of the TV Christmas ghost story back over the last few years. Obviously, yeah. Tractate Middeth, as you've mentioned, I think the Dead Room was another one, yeah. right? Um, Martin's Close and now the Mezzo Tint. Um, are you a fan of of Mark's work generally and his kind of a- recent adaptations? I am. I mean, we've talked um, at length about The League of Gentlemen and Inside Number Nine, mm-hmm. uh, obviously with Shear Smith, Steve Pemberton. I'm a huge man, uh, fan of Mark Gatiss. I think, I think he's amazing. Amazing. I'm so glad that he's, um, you know, pushing on and, and desperately trying to constantly revive the the ghost story at Christmas, uh, ghost story for Christmas tradition on the BBC. I think I think it's such a brilliant, charming, wonderful thing, um, and I think he does a great job. Like when I when I saw the track at Middeth. I was absolutely delighted. Like mm. it looks beautiful, so it's got a modern sheeniness to it. You know that scene where there's all the dust bowls um, in in the attic of, of uh, in the library. Yeah, uh, and it just looks beautiful. It looks like snow. It's just a gorgeous uh, shot. And then you get that reveal of um, the the sort of ghoul in the library, and it really reminded me. And and the late there's a later sort of like climax moment as well with with the revenant. Mm-hmm. And it really reminded me and put me in mind of those original um uh movie that you know those, yeah. those original adaptations and i think that um i think that he he's got such a fondness for them and there's a modernness to his to his work and there's a mark gatissness about it uh, a sort of playfulness that, that you know his his background i guess is in dark comedy originally mm-hmm. so you're gonna get a um a certain lightness. You're going to get a certain sort of like wink at the camera, I suppose, uh, from that comedy perspective. Um, but I think they're brilliant. I think they, I think they, and actually perhaps you could argue that that is the thing that the original adaptations don't have, which is that playfulness, that comedy that yeah. Mr. James absolutely has in his work. Um, so I, th- yeah, I think they're brilliant. Um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of all of them. Um, and the other thing is that, I mean, I'm predisposed to like them. I, I arrive at them giddy and <laughs> ready to love them. So, you know, as long as they are a ghost story and they're on TV... <laughs> I'm like I'm already delighted so yeah it's so true and you're so right I think that is the one thing that differentiates Mark Gatiss as a director from Lawrence Gordon Clark for example right is that that they do have that element of humor to them there is also a glossiness a sheen obviously this is the guy who partly is responsible for you know Sherlock the the BBC yeah. TV show exactly Dracula um also was involved in Doctor Who but that those those kind of old stories and British traditions being brought back in very much a kind of glossier modern way right yeah, um, yeah and i think he does that really well with with these stories and they're less weird they're less experimental they're a bit more conventional in the way they're told right but also really entertaining beautiful looking and and they do have some great scares like tractate that moment in the library and tractate is really great really great it's so ling- like it really lingers he knows how to do horror that lingers i think mm-hmm. you know and we know you know we know this about the league of gentlemen of course and that the that they are just obsessed with horror yeah you know um you know all four of them and and it shows you know that he, he there's no tourism here there's no tourism he he, yeah. he loves this genre and he understands it and um yeah well I, I, you know i i could understand people saying you know it, I, it's not quite to my taste but i i i think you know that i think they're brilliant i think and there's a the thing that he did a few years ago um called crooked house oh yeah which was yeah was which scary is a, it was brilliant absolutely yeah. brilliant and that could easily have, have sort of i think it was around christmas time wasn't it and that easily could fall into that same slot mm-hmm. but it's you know and yeah there is there is a glossiness to it that you know there's not a sort of um grubbiness to it that the that the the seventies had somehow mm. but I, I you know i i don't i don't mind it at all i think the aesthetic's great uh, i think the stories are always really good um yeah i'm i'm a fan yeah and and of course you know something that mark talked about quite a lot in our chat there is is about what a a battle it is to get these things made and i'm sure part of that pressure on him 
is to make something for a modern audience, right? Absolutely. You know, I don't think he would have had the freedom that Lawrence Gordon Clark probably would have had of just Absolutely. go off and make some fucking mental experimental yeah. film, you know, yeah. and just put it on the telly, you know? That's the thing. It's, there are it's it's a lot more difficult these days. It's a really hard sell and it, and it is an important question as well. Yeah, I under I, I kind of understand why it's a tricky sell in some ways, you know. It's 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 MR James. It's a, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was it was of a certain time, you know, yeah. that, that he was writing, and it's a, it's a very it's actually his stories are very 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 male dominated, mm-hmm. and and it's men of of a certain class and standing and education. So I fully understand why you know it would be it, it's a, it's a difficult sell. So uh, you know, which is why I'm quite glad when 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 you see um, the elements of his of his, of his stories that are slightly modernized that have been you know brought up today in in some ways you know it's hard to do it isn't it if, you, if you're adapting something from that particular period uh, but yeah um last thing i want to ask you before we get on to the mezzo tint itself mm. adam as a ghost story aficionado i'd love to know like are there any in particular any stories you'd recommend to listeners <laughs> and to me that we should read uh this ha- week uh, during the festive period how much time have we got, mate? Because <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I, right, we could do one of two things, right? I've got a list of ten here that I can just rattle through. Ooh, I won't, yeah. I won't, I won't talk about them. Uh, I won't, you know, I won't give you any details. I'll mm-hmm. just give you the list. Mm-hmm. Is that is that all right? Let's do it. That's that's a <laughs> okay. good plan. Because yeah, I suppose that's the point. I suppose we don't want to give too much away, do we? About no, things like this. yeah, yeah. And and to be honest, like I did try and whittle this down, but I was like, oh, I'm just gonna tell Mike I've got ten, and we'll just see what he says. <laughs> Let's do if, it. Let's rattle through. <laughs> That's ten. I can't okay. wait. All right, all right. So, um, first one uh, is the kit bag by Algernon Blackwood, mm-hmm. uh, which is set around Christmas time. Um, uh, that is uh, Algernon Blackwood is incredible. Um, if you don't know his work and you like Mr. James, then you should investigate Algernon Blackwood. Um, the Crown Derby Plate my, by Marjorie Bowen uh, is 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 a beaut. It's a really strange thing with a weird atmosphere. A fantastic ending. Mm. The Shadow by E. Nesbitt. So people will know E. Nesbitt who who wrote uh, The Railway Children. She wrote some incredible ghost stories uh, and you can find her stuff out there really, really easily. Uh, all of these so far are in the public domain so people can um, you know, find it. them online. Uh, there are you know, audio versions out there too. Uh, the 415 Express by Amelia B. Edwards. Amelia B. Edwards was such a cool uh, person, really interesting. Uh, was an incredible um, uh, academic, did lots of work in, in terms of Egypt, uh, uh, an Egyptologist and uh, incredible ghost story writer. Uh, I, here we have The Snow by Hugh Walpole. Now, I don't know if that's in the public domain, but that's a, it's got one of the best opening sentences of any story I have ever read. Ooh. So that's the, yeah, that's the snow. Snow by Hugh Walpole, Smee by A. M. Burridge. Uh, if you fancy a ghost story that's about a game of hide and seek in a dark <gasps> mansion, oh, um, uh, Smee is is the one for you. Um, Someone in the Lift by L. P. Hartley. Now this isn't in the public domain. I've really tried to find it, um, but it is in various different anthologies, including uh, Richard Dolby's uh, Ghosts for Christmas, which you can find, uh, I think, mostly secondhand uh, online. Um, it's a very sinister, strange tale, and it puts me in mind of Phoebe Cates' uh, monologue in Gremlins. It's got that sort of vibe about it. Um, so that's Someone in the Lift. Amazing. Last couple, uh, last couple are, are modern. Uh, uh, so Jen Ashworth is an incredible novelist, uh, and she wrote a, a ghost story called Dinner for One, and that is in a, a collection called Ghosts of Christmas Past. Mm-hmm. Um, and I read that uh, a couple of years ago, and it just absolutely blew me away. And then finally, I read a story this year, which is, brings us bang up today. Brand new ghost story. Well. Weird story, let's say weird story, mm-hmm. uh, called The Hanging of the Greens by Andrew Michael Hurley, Ooh. who wrote The Loney. Uh, and that's in a, a hardback collection called The Haunting Season. Um, and it's just it's just a beautiful, strange... It's got, it's got shades of A Christmas Carol in it, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it's just, a, it's just a peculiar and beautiful thing. So that's my 100 mile an hour list of 10... Uh, I love it! ghost stories that people should oh no I've missed one out sorry the story of a disappearance and an appearance which is an M.R. James story Mm -hmm. and it's the only M.R. James story that's set at Christmas 
Oh, um, stra- interesting. Stranger. That's yeah, really strangely. funny. Um, I love it. Well, thank you. What I'll do is I'll list all of those in the show notes and any that are public domain, we'll try and provide links to them as well so yeah, that people yeah. can just literally click on them and, and find them. Absolutely. Um, that's awesome. Well, let's get on to the mezzo tint then. And we'll say from this point, spoiler alert, so we will spoil uh, the BBC adaptation of the mezzo tint as we discuss it. Uh, so um, first of all, Adam, tell me your kind of history with this particular story. Are you a fan of the mezzo tint? How familiar with it were you before seeing this adaptation? Really familiar, I would say. I mean, it was. I think this is one of the earliest um, stories that I read by M.R. James. I remember reading O Whistle, and I remember reading uh, Canon Albrecht's scrapbook, mm-hmm. and I remember reading this because I didn't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, um, yeah. I just remember seeing it. It's such a it's such a distinctive word. Those two double Z's, and it's got that uh, Z sound, doesn't it? Like mm-hmm. pizza. That, mm-hmm. That's how you pronounce it. The mezzo tint, um, and um, yeah, it's 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 a very simple story. It's in three acts, isn't it? Uh, and I remember just being delighted by it when I when I first read it. This and I, it felt very familiar because at, at the time that I read it, I think I was in college. It had been about you know seventeen, eighteen. I've I'd seen this idea done lots of times before, mm. but th- this. Whether it's the origin of this idea of like you know the the moving painting, I don't know. It probably isn't, but it certainly feels like um, James puts his own spin on it and makes it this very sinister uh, 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 invention of, of of a haunted image that that changes when you look away from it. Um, so yeah, I was really familiar with it. Um, I always think about it, and it's interesting because we'll talk about this in detail, obviously about Gatiss's ad- adaptation. Um, it always feels like the thing about it is that the horror in this story is contained yes. perhaps perhaps a bit too much for, for a ghost story there's no threat because we know um, that it is contained to this particular object and actually as we'll discuss um, I think that's one of the massive successes of this adaptation the way it takes that further Right, you're so right. Let's let's just talk for context about. Mm. Just give us a little brief plot s- summary of the the story itself, Adam, of the M R James story. Yeah, so it's it's a really simple story. It's about um, a man called Williams, and he is a curator uh, at a, a museum, mm. uh, and the suggestion is that it is a, an art museum. Uh, um, at the University of Oxford. And he gets hold of uh, a mezzo tint, which is an engraving, basically. It's a, it's a particular sort of engraving mm. uh, from uh, from uh, an art dealer. And what ha- what begins to happen is, and it's it's more expensive than Williams expects it to be for, for a very simple and unremarkable mezzo tint, which, as he observes, is the worst kind of mezzo tint. Um, mm. And what we what we see of this, this kind of engraving of this house is that, it's changing every time he sort of leaves it be and a figure starts to appear on uh, on the image uh, and the figure starts to creep slowly towards this uh, this house in in the first instance um he discovers that there is some writing uh, accompanying it but he he doesn't give him the full detail of exactly the location of this house so you've got these two little mysteries happening side by side one is that this this hooded figure is moving in the painting every time they uh, he and his uh, colleagues look away um, and the other thing is that it seems to be a mezzo tint of an actual place uh, in in either Essex or Sussex he assumes but he doesn't know where and, he, mm. and therein lies the, the backstory I guess. Yeah it's a really fun story and there is just something like you say it's, it's kind of been done to death since right mm. but that idea of a painting that moves or or something that moves when you're not looking at it yeah is such a scary device isn't it it's this great. idea that every time he looks back at the painting that figure has moved either it's gone into the house and it's disappeared or it's halfway yeah. across the lawn or whatever um Ah, oh, there's something so brilliantly evocative and creepy, isn't there, just about Absolutely. that? And and actually, it even goes through all the way to like some real kind of modern classics like the Doctor Who episode Blink, doesn't it? Exactly. It, that's what it made the me think of, that idea of like the <laughs> things that obviously move towards you when you turn away from them and that kind of thing. What a fun idea for like it's a sort a good of monster. Idea. Yeah. The thing, the thing that always comes to my mind as well is uh, The Witches. Oh my god! Uh, yeah. Where you get the little girl who gets older, um, and she doesn't move when you're looking at the picture, and then eventually uh, she she disappears, doesn't she? Um, but yeah, it's 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 it has been borrowed loads of times before, and it's funny. 
only um, after watching this adaptation did I think of The Weeping Angels because I think that the way this adaptation works is it's it's that bit more televisual, that bit more cinematic, I guess, to a certain extent, mm-hmm. where it's, it, you know, the very brief periods of looking away, which isn't quite... Um, how James captures it as such, I think you have to sort of leave it be uh, for a little while before these That's changes right. happen. But that instantaneous um, threat getting closer is, yeah, it, it's brilliantly uh, uh, um, reminiscent of, of the Weeping Angels, I would say. So good, isn't it? And you're right, like there is um, it, everything, yeah, like you said perfectly, it's kind of contained in this M.R. Yeah. James story, isn't it? it so is. there is a sort of backstory, right, to this mm. figure mm. and this house that he investigates. Um, like you said yeah. that the, there is a kind of detective angle to a lot of these ghost stories and yeah. this one has that doesn't it where it uncovers this this story right of uh this man called francis who lives in this house and he has a poacher uh killed right and then this poacher kind of comes back for revenge almost it, essentially yeah yeah essentially that's it that's it and and it, it's a story of revenge isn't it really so you've got this you've got this um uh, man who owns the, the 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 manor and the house called francis mm-hmm. and uh yeah yeah, um, he he um, wants to get rid of poachers on his land, and in particular, there's one that you know is is a particular pain to him, which is uh, a man called Gordy. That's it. Which is a great name, Gordy. Uh, Gordy, so wonderful. Uh, and yeah, he he um, is able to capture him uh, poaching on his land, and and yeah, they they I think they describe it well. They, they sort of string him up basically, and and and, yes. and kill him. And um, and the the there's a sense that um, Gordy is going to well, it's this idea of like the, the curse of the you know taking the firstborn almost isn't it? Mm. It's almost biblical in that sense. Obviously, we know that um, uh, James is really interested in the Bible and biblical apocrypha, so you've got that sense of the you know, I, I will take your firstborn, mm. um, uh, the infant heir of of Francis, uh, and so that's what we we believe we're seeing played out, isn't it? With this kind of um, I guess it's almost like a zombie more than a ghost to a certain extent. This this sort of risen corpse mm-hmm. is crawling towards the house uh, with a cross on its back. Is one of the descriptions mm-hmm. uh, in, in in the story. But it is contained in 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 um, James's version in this to, to a point almost where there's a question. Uh, by one of the characters, which is, is this something that is going to happen? Is it a premonition? Yes. Or is it something that's already happened? And actually, it's interesting that James decided to to make it something that had already happened, because in that sense, the the story of the Mezzotint has very little jeopardy in it, right? There's no sense that 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 Revenant is going to come out into the world that Williams occupies as such. It's still scary and disturbing. Yeah, um, Will- Williams, our kind of main character, is is completely unaffected by this ghost or monster, yeah. right? He's just uncovering something that happened once via this yeah. mezzo tin. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so then, of course, Mark Gatiss, what he's done is kind of adapted it and he's added, he's made the stakes a bit higher, hasn't he? Yes. This TV adaptation. So first of all, Adam, let me just start off by asking you, what did you think of uh, Mark Gatiss's adaptation? I thought it was fantastic. I was yeah. really, really delighted uh, to watch it. Um, I, I, it's got it, right from the first couple of moments. You've got a playfulness in there, which you know, even sort of, even in the the lettering uh, of the mezzo tint when that yeah. pops up, I was like, oh, here we go. This is going to be fun, um, and. It, it it follows that story really faithfully. It updates certain characters so that it's not just you know all you know men of a certain standing, um, yeah, of a certain education. Uh, it, we we have some female characters in there as well, which is which is you know occasionally you do get female characters in Mr. James, of course you do, but uh, I don't think there are any in this story mm-hmm. on the page. No, um, so you've got these you know these little um, uh, updates. Uh, for for a contemporary uh, uh, contemporary world, yeah, um, and yet he tells the story pretty faithfully, I would say. Um, but then we have this extra element of Rory Kinnear's character, Williams. He has a direct connection. Mm-hmm. to the image to the backstory and that i thought was a bit of a masterstroke because that if i would if i were to say there was anything missing from the mezzo tint the story in terms of jeopardy in terms of investment that i you might suggest was it yes um and and you know i think some people might watch it and go well that's a little bit you know mapped on it's a little bit crowbarred in and maybe yeah maybe you could say that i didn't mind at all i liked it i thought, I thought it was really inventive 
uh, and a brilliant way to make it more dramatic. Yeah, I loved it. it in some ways, it, ma- it weirdly, right, it makes it feel more Jamesian than the original James story because yeah. <laughs> it ends with that terrifying, monstrous presence, you know, yes, um, exactly. at the end. So it kind of it gives you the the pacing and that, like you described it, the wallop that you expect to see from something like this, don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I thought it was genius that idea of. Um, you know, he's looking at this painting of this house, something's getting closer, and then eventually it's his house, and, and yes. we get that kind of, that, that presence creeping in through his window. It's re- absolutely really great way of kind of building um, the suspense. And yeah, yeah. I liked, uh, you know, like you said, he kind of, he slightly has kind of diversified the characters in this and modernised it, and that was quite nice. I actually really liked yeah. the um, the character of Mrs. A- uh, Ambig- Ambrigale, uh, played yeah. by Frances Barber, who kind of explains yeah. the backstory of Frances and Gordy and all of that. Yeah, and I she's that the was expert, really fun. right? Yeah. yeah, she's the expert, and and I, I yeah, and, and brilliantly played by Francis Barber. Mm-hmm. There's the, she really makes that role something exciting. You know, the, there is this thing, there is this trope in the ghost story of the expert who who basically rocks up and and knows some stuff uh, and warns people. And sometimes in in James, actually, it's it's the it's the sort of you know the the manservant or the skip or the the sort of working class character who comes along and has these superstitious beliefs. Um, which which are I wouldn't say they're necessarily mocked by the academics, but they're they're dismissed pretty heartily. But it always transpires that their perspectives are the ones we should have been listening to all the time. Um, so yeah, so it, it was great to see Francis Barber in that in that role uh, of the expert. Um, what yeah. do you think of the conversation? There is a sort of there's a sort of ongoing conversation throughout the episode as well. Obviously, it's set in like a university, right? And yeah. very much a kind of all boys kind of university, right? And they are having yeah. this conversation, this debate throughout about whether or not they should start letting women, you know, into this university yeah. and that kind of thing, right? Which, again, isn't in part of the Mr. James story. No. What do you think of the addition of that kind of, you know, it's just it's very small, but it's kind of part of the conversation throughout, isn't it? It's it's small, but it pops up a few times, doesn't it? So yeah. it, it, it it seems to be a device to sort of tell us where we are historically, because this is set. I think this is set later than. Is it set in the twenties? I can't remember. Yes, I think it's set yeah. in the twenties. The, the, uh, James's. Um, sorry. Mark Gates' adaptation is, is is set later than the uh, than the original is, so it, it you know it positions us in terms of where we are historically. But the other thing it does is it talks it it allows Williams to have that line about you know we should think about the future we shouldn't be looking to the past all the time he's talking about progress to a certain extent i think that it isn't really explored very much i think that it isn't um pursued and kind of like you know um uh i don't know put together at the end in a particularly satisfying way we don't get any kind of resolution about that conversation but it, you know, it's it's it's. I think it's a. I think it's an interesting political thing to be in this story that that otherwise would essentially just be, as I say, you know, educated Oxford um, privileged men essentially. Yes. Um, whether, and, the, and in the story, they kind of mainly talk about sort of golf and whatever, it, don't they? I suppose. So and, I guess it's yeah. in. I guess it's a it's a slightly more interesting way of updating the dialogue yeah. in general. I think it is. Um, and you uh, either have you either have that in there. Right, and and you make a a point, or you know you have that included within this story, this kind of very old fashioned story, uh, uh, or you don't. You yeah, know? and I would sort of say, well, no, let's have it in rather yeah. than not. You know, and th- th- yeah, you're right. I mean, I like I could have done, like part of me was like, is it something to? Is it exploring this idea of, I don't know, sort of the escaping the past or moving on or looking forward to the future and this idea of whether this what they're seeing in the painting is it the past or the future and i was trying to figure out maybe that if there was something sort of in that but i don't know if there is necessarily it's just kind of touched upon isn't it i think there is because i think that that's that's the I picked up on the the fact that william says yeah we must you know i've been thinking about what you know our colleague said about women having degrees. Yeah, we must we must look to the future, not to the past. So mm-hmm. I think it is. I think it is literally there to to fulfil that role. Mm-hmm. It is underexplored, and I think if 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 there was anything about this um, this film that that you know that I felt wasn't as satisfactory as the rest of it, it would just be that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think it sort of picks up, it sort of starts to pull up that thread and then doesn't really explore it yeah. um, and, and conclude it in a particular way. But again, you either you either have dialogue um, uh, that, that brings the story forward in time a little bit and, 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 and situates it historically, because as, as I say, it's, it's set a few years mm-hmm. uh, after... Um, uh, quite a few years after M.R. James's original. Yeah. Or you don't, or you just don't have that in there. So yeah. I think, you know, um, or you just don't make an M.R. James story, I guess, is the other is the, the other option. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Um, let me ask you a bit about the, you know, the painting itself, right? Again, this is something that, you know, you, we, we all maybe picture in our heads that there's descriptions of, there's great descriptions of it in the story. Here, obviously, we see it. Actually, funnily enough, I, th- I believe that the artwork and the design was all done by a friend of the pod, Richard Wells, uh, who's been on the podcast before so he actually he did a lot of the kind of design elements of this uh what do you think of it of the of the mezzo tint itself and the the images of this creature i think it's brilliant yeah i've got three richard wells prints on my wall he's so good isn't he i love his work i love his work um uh yes uh, i i think it's i think it's fantastic there are um other versions of the mezzo tint that exist um which are storytelling versions uh if anyone has the bfi collection they'll know there's the robert powell one and there's the spine chillers one and both of those i think have these mezzo tints included in them you know Mm. like there's little there's little graphic of them because it's cheap and easy to do mm-hmm. or what would have would have been you know uh, at that point to to uh, rather than to you know have a, a full set of a, of a mansion or whatever um and and so we i feel familiar with what i think the house looks like uh, what the hall looks like this one i think is the very best and i didn't know it was richard wells before you you, you told me that mm-hmm. um uh, the very best one that I've seen. It's creepy. The design of the creature uh, arriving is so good and it, and it gives you just enough. It doesn't show you too much. And I think in the past, those two um, uh, Jack and Nori style um, versions, it, we linger a bit too much. And actually, this idea of a skeleton in a hood is not that scary anymore. You know, no, it sounds of, a bit kind of <laughs> Halloween costume shop type yeah, thing, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. We've seen it in Bill and Ted. Yeah, not quite, you know, not quite the Grim Reaper, <laughs> yeah. but it's that, you know, it's that kind Monty of idea. Monty Python, the meaning yeah. of life. It's yeah, like... Exactly. <laughs> and, and any ghost train you've ever been on. Yeah. So, so it's not quite scary. Um, not that scary. But when you get... Um, when we hear this description of the of of or oh, that that skeleton in the image, and then you combine that with the images that um that 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 show you know that we we're shown, that I think is really effective because it's 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 still very strange. The image of the of the figure retreating with the infant in this particular adaptation of the mezzo tent, I think is exceptional. It's really yeah. creepy. Ah, yeah, I loved it. I I loved loved it it. as well. And you're right, like that idea of, you know, it's something that is so good about these adaptations that these these monsters sound as old as time, like yeah. a whistle and I'll come to you being literally a white sheet, right? And yet somehow these adaptations do such an amazing job of making those scary, you know, yeah. that, that yeah. you just would not imagine to be that scary. Um, Absolutely. It's it's so well done. I love the look of that. And and again, there's something, you know, they describe the, the mezzo tint in the story quite a lot, right? As mm. being fairly ordinary looking, like they're yeah. quite uh, annoyed that it's worth yeah. as much money as it <laughs> yeah. is and everything, yeah. right? Um, so there's that kind of balance of it looking sort of of every day yeah but then also having something quite chilling about it as well and yeah i love the way that that creature the the first couple of times when you just see it right on the periphery like you just Mm. see a bit of an arm or whatever you know right in the corner of the of the uh, mezzo tint it's great and that it's crawling to the house yeah you know that is a brilliantly weird detail that it's crawling Mm. um and i don't think we actually get this said in the um in this adaptation but in the story um it's described of uh, i think you see its leg and it's described as being horribly thin yeah it's just like wow that's just so simple like it's that economy of language Mm -hmm. that that first makes james an absolute genius and a delight to read because it's so simple, horribly thin, such a simple thing. Um, but also allows a director like Mark Gatiss to come along and go, okay, what would that actually look like? How would I, how would I put my stamp on that very ordinary couple, a uh, couple of words, horribly thin? How will I, how will I conjure that? Mm. Um, and the wisps of hair. I think it talks about it having wisps of hair. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, uh, the visuals are. are 
outstanding in this. And it's again, you know, like we could talk about its influence, this story forever. Mm. But like again, there's something about it that reminds me of something like The Ring, you know, as well, with oh, this yeah. idea of this presence crawling towards totally. the cam, the, the television, and then coming into the real world as well. Yeah. There was something of it. There, there's a there's a J horror, uh, Asian horror kind of influence yeah. there, and everything isn't there. And again, um, it's more it's way more dramatic in this adaptation than in the story. Yes, um, and and I and I you know. I say that with with the utmost reverence uh, for Emma yeah. James, <laughs> but yeah. I think it's way more dramatic in this. And actually, I think it's a bit of a masterstroke that we get that um, that brilliant moment in in the in the very last scene where we we see this revealed uh, image and it's and it's Williams's house, mm. and and you get that. It is very, you know, weeping angels. He's looking away and looking back and that creature is getting closer and closer and closer. Um, yeah, I think it's brilliantly... It's just a brilliantly dramatic thing and definitely borrows from The Ring, I think, in that sense. So it's, yeah. it's almost come full circle, right? Because you might imagine that The Ring was borrowing from the story of the Metro yes. tent and then this feels like it borrows from uh, right. The Ring in that sense. It's so true. And we've talked before about The Ring feeling uh you know a, a little bit like something like casting the runes in its yeah. structure and its plot right again so there totally. is a lot of kind of give and take here it's so true yeah. um yeah and i love i i think mark did a great job of actually directing this in terms of camera work there's a really clever fun shot before the final reveal right where we get a camera angle from the outside of his house did you notice yeah. that that is exactly yes. the painting the angle of the the the, the house uh yeah. as seen in the mezzo tin which is a really and fun little thing knowing this story as i do knowing mr james's work as i do it, it was a real fun thing actually because as soon as i saw that i was like oh, i know what's going to happen here yeah. like i i i guessed it and that wasn't a problem that, that that didn't feel i mean the thing is as soon as you heard the the surname francis earlier on in the story if you know this story well there's no doubting as to where we're headed really mm -hmm. but when i saw that i was like oh that's such a masterful uh, shot and i think all of it there, there are some really weird and i say that as a compliment really weird decisions in terms of these shots like it's it's a very I feel I feel a bit queasy at times watching it. Everyone's yes. a little bit too close. Yeah. It's like, could you step back a bit, please, Rory? You're ready. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think Mark was saying that he kind of they gradually kind of changed lenses throughout. Yeah. So what we're getting is a kind of closer and sort of less flattering yeah, angle yeah. of Rory Kinnear as it goes yeah. on right throughout the thing it's so clever that and it gets kind of sweatier and grosser it does it, it does on. and you're right up in his face at one point you're like wow I can see I can feel the bristles of your moustache <laughs> um, but it, but uh, everything feels very um claustrophobic in this film there's a shot early on i think it's of a church or it might just be the outside actually it might be the outside of the of the museum uh, in oxford mm. and and i was looking at that thinking that is a deliberately tight shot because you could absolutely have given us a way more open shot than that. Mm. We could like the, the top of the building is slightly uh, cut off uh, if if I if I'm not wrong, mm. and I just thought, wow, it reminded me of of sort of if you've ever used um, uh, a full frame uh, like DSLR camera. Um, and usually before that you, you sort of graduate to that from a not full frame camera and yeah. it's that sort of slight cutting off of what you can see mm -hmm. and I was like that I, I think there's some genius moves uh, in this in terms of um, uh, photography direction and yeah it, it, it just adds to that claustrophobia it obviously is nodding to this idea of it being that what we were talking about earlier, it being contained, you know, yes. there's a containment, which is part of the horror here. Yes. And that horror getting literally closer and closer and closer, right? Gradually yeah. and organically. Yeah. yeah. It's a really clever thing. Um, let is. me just quickly ask you about the plot differences itself then. And we've touched upon this already, but there's this basically reveal, right? That Williams is actually a Francis, right? That he yeah. was like an illegitimate child. And is the idea in this version that like, because this Francis wiped out this poacher, he wiped out the whole, like, the, was he like the last remaining member of the Gordy family, essentially? And then this, like, spirit, zombie, whatever, was coming back to kind of wipe out the, the Francis I think line. That's the idea. Is that what it was? I yeah. think that's the idea. The idea is that, that Gordy has taken, in the story, um, taken Francis's heir. Yes. That's the baby that he steals away. Um, and I think, actually, in this, the, there was a moment where I thought, ooh, is he the stolen baby? Is that mm. is that what we're going to find out? Yeah. Um, but that 
I, I wonder whether that was something that was explored uh, uh, in the writing. I don't know, mm. um, but it doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it. But yeah, I think that's the idea: is that that the the revenant is is turning up to to take away the final Francis. Now, yeah. the, the, the longer you look at that, the more. <laughs> The more tangled that is as a plot device, because you go, well, why has he got to sort of like fifty years old? Yeah, uh, why, why is he doing it exactly yeah. now? That is, is, yeah. and, but is it is it in some way linked to that mezzo tint? I think definitely it is. But even that, I'm sort of going, well, is this just massive coincidence? Is that <laughs> is that ghost just like going, oh yes? Can yeah. you imagine how lucky? That, yeah, yeah, um, it's the true. stars have aligned. But <laughs> but you know, I don't mind. I don't mind stuff like that. It's a ghost story. It's fun, isn't it? Um, it but is. yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. I think I think. The the idea is that um, this this you know this ghoul is now turned up to to claim this this last uh, person of the, of this lineage, um, and then the, you know the other question I had is where did that new mezzotint come from? Right, um, it just magically changed into a different did. one, right? It yeah, did, yeah. But um, again, I don't, I just don't mind. It's honestly, I don't. I, I things like that. I think it's it's really fun. You're going to have you know um, logic bombs and and holes in plot for for mm-hmm. something as fantastical as a ghost story sometimes. And I don't mind. I really don't. No, doesn't bother me either because it just it feels like okay, that's what happens to yeah. this 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 mezzo tint itself is supernatural in some way, right? Yeah. Um, and then finally, then let's talk about that ending. We've touched upon it already, <sighs> but we do have the, the in in classic tradition of these television plays, we get the reveal of mm. this monster as it crawls through the window, right, and sort of towards the camera. Uh, yeah. What did you think of it? That kind of realization of the of the revenant. I thought it was brilliant. I think I think um it starts off being that lingering creepy strange thing where you get the sort of the hands pulling up the window and then the the sort of limbs coming through and the and the the the, the you know the cloak swishing through last so you get the sense of exactly what we're dealing with we know it's that reverend revenant of course from the image and then you get that very very bold decision to show a lot of the monster mm. like a lot you do it's on screen for what feels like a long time yes so you yeah. can really drink in all the gory details of this uh, horrendous kind of rotting corpse and mm. um, i i un- i would understand why people wouldn't be so hot on that i loved it though it reminded me of stuff like uh, creep show it reminded me even of um in the original uh, adaptations where you get those lingering shots on the the you know the the ghoul that shows up I mentioned the ashtray earlier, even like um the signalman where you get that strange alabaster mask yeah. thing and you're on that for ages it's not a quick glimpse you're on that for ages, um I liked it I I I didn't mind it at all I, you know I I have a feeling that is something some people are going to take against, um yeah uh, people who just like things you know in shadow and I get that um but I was into it. I can't decide. I love the way it looked, but I can't decide yeah. whether I might have preferred it had it just ended with maybe just the arm coming through the window yeah. or something. You know, like I think when that that moment occurred, when he saw it moving towards the house in the Metzotin and then he turned yeah. round and it was just there in the window, I gasped. Like I really <laughs> did. That's really freaked me out. Yeah. And then it does go on for me, maybe just a tad too long, but also... I didn't mind it because I kind of loved looking at that thing. Because sometimes you just want to see it, don't you? Yeah. As well, yeah, yeah. like you want to yeah. see what it looks like, and its horrible kind of skeletal sort of face, yeah. and um, was very creepy. To- it really was, and it's totally in keeping with the tone of the whole thing. Yeah, like if it had, if if it had been a very somber, serious drama all the way through, but it felt very melodramatic at times. There's yeah. so many, there's so much kind of. You know the, the the shot of the of the three of them kind of looking at the mezzo tin, and he says it's a child, and it's so yeah. melodramatic and over the top, and that's what that's kind of what I want from a yeah. TV ghost story. And so, we know, so- right? We know from Mark Gatiss, we know from the League of Gentlemen, and FYI to anyone listening, the League of Gentlemen Christmas special is the stuff of oh. genuine nightmares as well. Yeah, it really is. It but really is. they, <laughs> there's a moment in that right involving a. A, a, a Papa Lazarou as Father Christmas that is so horrific and it really lingers and it goes on and on and uh, it also reminded me of a of a, an end 
ending of a particular Inside Number Nine episode called The Harrowing as well. Do oh, you remember yeah. that one? Adam? Oh, yeah. And, and the yes. way that that one ends, in it's a sort of similar thing where these guys kind of love to show us it, don't they? They yep, show they the do. monster, they linger on the monster. Um, yeah. And that's kind of great because you don't get a lot of that these days as well. I was just going to say, where off, where else do you get that? Where else do you get the, the kind of lingering shot? And, you know, creature design in... in let, let's say something like The Thing, right? We get a lot of that design. We see a lot of that design. We linger on it. It's brightly lit. Mm. And I think that film, one of the the reasons it stands up so well is because that design is so good. Yeah. So when the design is good and the idea is scary and the creature is also scary, I think it works. I don't mind that lingering shot. It does definitely make it, in, in this context, a lot more like um, you know the old horror comic books uh, yeah. used to be. Like, as I said, the, the, uh, the creep show is, is sending up. But... Yeah. I, I I really like it. I'm yeah. re- I, I'm I'm here for it. Yeah, yeah, love it. So there you go. Um, so obviously for 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 people listening, we'd we, a big recommend for a Christmas Eve viewing. Adam. I would say so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I definitely would. And, and I really hope this continues. And I hope that um, I hope I hope that I, I obviously I love Mark Gatiss's work, and I hope he does more of these. But I hope this. I hope more writers and directors get opportunities to 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 um to to do this. I mean, obviously, I want to see some modern ghost stories. That's fantastic. But there are some amazing other writers as well that haven't been explored at all. You know, E Nesbit. Mm. Let's see some E Nesbit ghost stories at Christmas. Honestly, my goodness, if you haven't read E Nesbit's ghost stories, check them out because they are amazing and they would be such good adaptations as well. So let's yeah. Let, yeah, let's let's keep the tradition going. I think I agree, and I think to your casual. BBC viewer on Christmas Eve I don't think they would care whether it's Mr. James E. Nesbitt or whoever else like I think you just want to watch a really good yeah. half hour play don't you yeah you know? and I think I think definitely Mr. James immediately sells like immediately yeah. you go oh I know that name mm-hmm. but I think if it's a good ghost story and and you know like E. Nesbitt as I say is, is amazing Edith Wharton is is absolutely exceptional as well um, and I think these are big kind of ghost story royalty names in the way that you know more contemporary writers like Susan Hill are um, yeah. uh, and I think that I, yeah I think there's there's so much out there to explore let's not just have one at Christmas Mike let's have like five or six leading, totally. <laughs> leading up to Christmas Eve uh, and let's um, like just saying let's get some Adam Robinson ghost stories out there on telly come on oh yeah I should have been on. saying that what was I thinking <laughs> what am I doing advertising other people yeah that's what I meant that's yeah, what I meant exactly exactly um, I love it well Adam what an absolute joy as ever thank you so much for thank you. for joining me um and i will ask you to plug some of your stuff and i will also say and i'm going to plug this for you but mm. uh, if anyone has enjoyed listening to me and adam talking about tv ghost stories there we had a chat recently on your podcast didn't we the we ghost did. story book club which honestly i'm not just saying this was one of my favorite chats i've ever had oh, on, I uh, loved, it was so I much fun it. but yeah. um me and adam discussed our top 10 ghost story movies of all yes, time didn't we yes, on your podcast indeed. so if anyone's yeah. enjoyed listening to this please please go and please check do. that out it's just coming um, to an end series two is coming to an end at the moment and um we are there's one episode left i'm not entirely this will be got out possibly after it or maybe the same day mm-hmm. um, but but I'm just about to put out our final episode of series two which is we're talking about the signalman and it's me and uh, Jen Ashworth who I mentioned earlier actually she oh, heard her story and the signalman um, is so good it's so good yeah but yeah Mike I loved our episode it was such a lot of fun um, and yeah people people really enjoyed listening to it as well but so yeah thank so you for doing so it. so good and also go back and find our uh in inside number nine league of gentlemen <gasps> yeah. episode which also has reese and steve on there so i feel like we've completed the set now adam <laughs> yeah. like we've got everyone yeah. we've got everyone yeah. uh, here in our discussions um but in the meantime also just let people know where they can find you and more of your work out there online. yeah i guess the best place is come and find me on twitter which is at adam underscore z e d um on facebook you'll find the book of darkness and light which is my theater company um, and yeah, my podcast, The Ghost Story Book Club, is out there wherever you get your podcast. Which I'm really pleased about the way that that podcast has developed, Mike, because it was it was just a little thing um, that I you know I did as a bit of an experiment in in lockdown. And uh, of course, Rihanna was was my very first guest. On that. We talked about Edith Wharton's Mr. Jones, and it was just a it was a live stream thing that that was just a bit of fun. Um, and then yeah, it's grown and it's found an audience. And yeah, I'm I'm now thinking about what series two will. Uh, so series three will look like uh, next year so yeah come and come and find me on there amazing adam thank you so much thank you
And that's it for our Christmas Ghost Stories special. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my two guests, the brilliant Adam Robinson and the amazing Mark Gatiss. I'm very lucky to have been joined by both those guys this week. Uh, So I would love to hear from you guys. Let me know what Christmas ghost stories would you recommend and let me know your thoughts once you've seen it on the Mezzo Tint. And just a reminder, that's airing on BBC Two at 10.30pm on Christmas Eve. So let me know your thoughts on that. Email me evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. Don't forget you can also find the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners, then join the discussion group. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group and you can find that on Facebook. Thank you so much for listening. Have a very Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Stay safe. Be kind. And join us again next week for another episode of The Evolution of Horror. Horror.